Good morning, friends. Welcome back to your 8 a.m. lecture. This morning, my dog has been very cuddly and wants to say hi. This is Rocky. He's the best. Say hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. He's the bestest. Okay, enough of Rocky. Hope you're having a great day. Bye-bye. Okay, that's Rocky. He's the best. He's been very snuggly today. He likes quarantine, so I'm always here. All right. <laughs> I thought that might get some conversation. <laughs> Cute dog. Thanks, Dan. All right. Welcome back to your favorite class. Rawr! 8 a.m. and I still have energy. Must be all of this coffee. Sweet, sweet love coffee. All right. Homework five on cure kinetics and rheology due on Wednesday. I moved the due date back. I was going to have it due today, but I moved it back to Wednesday because we didn't quite finish up everything we needed to. So Without further ado, let's pick up where we left off, which was talking about viscosity, rheology, rheometers, measuring viscosity, all the good things. Okay. Writing pad. There we are. All right. Away we go. Last time. We were talking about viscosity and rheometry. So remember viscosity, I mean, you kind of know what this is physically, but mathematically we define it as the slope of the stress versus strain rate curve when putting an object in shear. So remember here that we typically will show scientifically how liquids or fluids behave with something like strain rate on the x-axis usually given with the symbol gamma dot. This is a shear strain rate, just to be clear. And then on the x-axis here, we have shear strain. Or sorry, the y-axis, we have shear stress, usually given by tau. Typical Newtonian fluids, which is like 99% of fluids, will behave in this general fashion, some linear behavior between strain rate and shear stress. So the experiment that you should have in your head is like, um, to a fluid between two plates, right? So you've got some fluid, it's honey or it's water. In situation number one, if the bottom plate is stationary and I'm trying to push the top plate, if it's water, well, yeah, it's really easy to push that, all right? But if it's honey, it's a lot harder to push that particular um, plate, all right? So that's the idea of what you should have in your head for viscosity. And the slope of this particular line here is eta, which is going to be equal to what is the shear stress, the rise over the run. That's why viscosity usually has units of something like pascals times seconds, because this is in units of one on seconds. All right, strain rate, one on seconds. Shear stress in pascals. All right, so you see viscosity in pascal seconds. All right, so here this red line is Newtonian fluid, which is most fluids. Now, I don't need to tell you all that. You obviously learned that in your fluids class, obviously, okay? If not, what are they doing, all right? There are other types of fluids that you probably saw uh, that we're not gonna really talk about, but it might be like a shear thickening fluid or shear thinning fluid, so on and so forth. We're not really gonna talk about this. Shear thinning and shear thickening. So those particular fluids, if you've ever made like cornstarch and water, or have you ever seen those videos where like people make cornstarch and water, when you like slap it, it behaves like a solid, right? So it's really like structurally sound, behaves like a solid. But if you like stand on top of it, you like sink into it. Yeah, that's a shear thickening fluid. So it behaves differently as it's strained differently. When you slap it, it behaves like a solid. When you stand on it, it behaves like a liquid. All right, so that's shear thickening and shear thinning fluids. Now, why we care for composites, you know, we care for composites because as they cure, the viscosity changes. And we definitely need to know how the viscosity changes if we're going to you know, have things like what is the working life? What is the gel time? What is the time that it takes us to get to fully solid? All right. And so important to know 
for manufacturing reasons. MFG reasons. All right. So we showed some data about what the viscosity of a particular epoxy system might look like over time, given various cure temperatures. All right. So some example data for epoxy system uh, might look like something like this. Right, we're here. The viscosity is sort of like shooting up to infinity at some certain time. Um, and I'll say, becoming a man. No, just kidding. It's becoming a solid. Where this viscosity starts to go to infinity. So we can measure what the viscosity of this fluid is using what's called a rheometer. I kind of showed what a picture of, what's, uh, of what, what of those looked like last time. And we see that different cure temperatures lead to different evolutions of the viscosity of the epoxy as it's being cured. If we hold a cure temperature relatively low, then it's going to take a lot longer for our viscosity to shoot up to infinity, rather than if we sort of give it some heat and let it um, go, then it's just going to you know, turn into a solid very, very quickly. All right, which is what we see kind of on this end of the spectrum, where we're now curing at uh, a higher temperature. All right, so as the cure temperature sort of increases, um, we have a decrease in the amount of time that it takes for this piece to become solid. So the approximate time for when this occurs, Uh, which might be here, something like T for 97, here's the T for 107, so on and so forth. This is the time at which it sort of shoots up to infinity. These are the gel times. So this is how you might determine a gel time if you have a new resin system. You're working for DuPont or 3M or whatever, and you're creating a new resin. I don't know how long is it going to take. Uh, for this thing to solidify or until it can't really work anymore, well, that time is going to be the amount of time it takes for ha this viscosity to sort of shoot up to infinity. So mix up your little resin chemistry, put it into a rheometer, press the go button, and just wait until the rheometer says, it's a solid now, okay? Or the viscosity is crazy high, I can't, like, rotate my spindle anymore. All right, so that's how we determine gel time. Now, it would be nice if we could come up with a model for this. And that's about where we left off last time. Because if we knew something about the chemistry, knew something about activation energy, its temperature dependence, all this sort of stuff, then we could just apply some model to our resin and say, all right, if it's cured at this temperature for this amount of time, your gel time is this. This temperature, this time, your gel time, your gel time is this. So, so on and so on and so forth. All right. Now, the most uh, widely used model. Uh, you'll have to kind of think about what the viscosity depends on. All right. So this eta is going to be a function of many things obviously temperature right so if i have some liquid and i heat it up the viscosity decreases right uh, so that's pretty well understood it's going to be a function of the strain rate so sort of as we showed before if you're on this viscosity uh shear strain versus shear stress curve depending on where you are you could have a different viscosity for your particular piece all right so it's going to depend on we'll say is a function of temperature, obviously. It's going to be a function on degree of cure because the more, the further along my resin cure is, the lower, uh, the higher the viscosity is going to be because we're thermal set, we're approaching uh, a solid material as we go. And also it's going to be dependent on shear rate, which is gamma. So here, temp, obviously, 
degree of cure. And strain rate. So if we remember our sort of viscosity curve, or here this is gamma dot, and here this is tau, the most general model would say that the viscosity does depend on uh, the strain rate. However, for Newtonian fluids, remember this is Newtonian, which is all we're really going to depend on, all we're really going to talk about in this class, we'll say that there's no strain rate dependence. Because we see whether we're here on the curve or here on the curve or here on the curve, which is kind of the function of gamma dot, the slope of that particular line is the same at all points. All right. So uh, so if Newtonian our eta is not a function of strain rate. Okay, and so we will assume this to be true. So, not for us. If we had one of those other crazy types of fluid that I was talking about, which might be like a shear thinning fluid or a shear thickening fluid, well then, yeah, obviously, as the strain rate changes, the slope of this line here or here or here is changing. Okay, so if it was non Newtonian, meaning the shear thinning or shear thickening or some other crazy type of fluid behavior, then we might need to include that. But for us, we don't really care about the strain rate, that is, how fast we're sort of stressing or straining this particular liquid we're going to assume that there's no strain rate dependence. All right. Another thing we really got to care about is the temperature, obviously, and the degree of cure. Now, the degree of cure is going to be handled by things that we talked about before, things like the activation energy and um, some of the kinetics models that we had discussed before. So I will say... Dependence on degree of cure comes from kinetics. Okay, so some of the models that we talked about before, the nth order model, the general rate equation, those sorts of things can feed into the viscosity models through this degree of cure uh, evolution. I will say, though, that when curing these materials, they go through a chemical reaction that follows the rate, which is the very similar rate to how degree of cure proceeds. So what I mean by that is usually rate constants for kinetics. Remember, these were like your K1 and K2. are Arrhenius with temperature. So meaning it was something like K1 equals AE to the delta, uh, well, let's just say, let's just say RT. This is just the general formation or RT or something along the likes. All right, so some exponential relationship, all right? Uh, I think it's, we wrote delta E on R cap T, but this is the general rate equation. All right, so we would expect the viscosity evolution to have similar looking character. All right, and so the most general viscosity equation is kind of this Arrhenius relationship. All right. The most general and pretty well accepted model 
is the Arrhenius model. Gotta make sure I spell his name right. Forgot an H before, I think. A R R H E N I U S model. And that model here is just that the viscosity of the piece is exponential with temperature, with some constants that are embedded that are dependent on experiment. So that model is the evolution of the viscosity. Let's see if I can make a better eta. Is equal to some initial value of the viscosity. We'll call it eta naught. And e to the, here's my sort of exponential Arrhenius relationship. Or here, this is E on R T. Here's your most general model. Let's define some of these things. Obviously, this is viscosity. A to not, this is some constant value or um, initial slash constant. Value. All right, so it's got the same units. Uh, viscosity typical will be in like Pascal seconds. This constant will also have units of something like Pascal seconds. All right. E is your activation energy, just like we had for the rate equation K. Uh, so English units is calories per gram. I'll say this is joules per gram. All right. That's a common, um, uh, sorry, joules per gram. And I need some, joules per gram is common, but use per gram mole is another value. This is measured through experimentation. Uh, R, gas constant, pirate's favorite constant, R. All right, so this is 8.314 uh, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, I think is the actual value. T, temperature. Here, units of Kelvin. Don't forget that this model has to use temperature and Kelvin. And that sort of defines your whole relationship here. All right, so I'll say that this value here, and this value here, gotten from experiment. Most of the stuff that we do now when we're talking about modeling real data is gotten through experiment. You may see this in an alternate form, which is like a, a linear form. So we can linearize this. By taking log of both sides. So my general equation, eta is eta not e to the e on r t. Okay, if I take the log both sides, here I'll take natural log both sides. We'll have the natural log of the viscosity equal to the natural log of this whole thing, which is eta zero e to the e on r t. All right. So when you have a logarithmic logarithmic function of two things together, that's like the log of both of those things added together. Okay. So simplifying further, we have the natural log of this guy equals to the natural log of the first piece, which is this eta naught, added with the natural log of the second piece, which is E activation energy on RT. Okay. Well, uh, pretty obvious to see here that uh, these guys are going to like whittle each other out or whittle each other away. And you'll end up with kind of this alternate expression, which is the log of the viscosity is equal to, uh, it's just going to be left over with these pieces. And I'll write them in kind of a strategic way here. This is E on R times one on T plus the natural log of this constant a to zero. This is sort of your linearized form of this viscosity equation. 
I mean, it's not really linear because you're plotting the log of the viscosity on one axis. This is like your, this is like slope intercept equation form. So y equals m x plus b, where this is y, this is m, the slope of your line, x is one on t, and b is the intercept. All right, so this is the general form of this equation. So if you plot the log of the viscosity as a function of one on temperature, you will expect a straight line. This is a linear equation. All right, <clears throat> so let's look at what some of that data actually looks like. So data. like this. Okay, so here we see a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. So what's happening is on the y-axis we're plotting the natural log of the viscosity. All right, so it's actually the viscosity but it's plotted on a logarithmic scale. That's why it looks linear. And on the x-axis here you have one on T, or here 1,000 on T, which is a little bit strange. But the idea here is that as we move to the right, one on T is increasing. And as we move to the right, the actual temperature of the object is decreasing, right? So there's this inverse relationship. The larger T gets, the smaller one on T gets, and vice versa. So what we're showing here is that as one on T gets bigger here, the viscosity also gets bigger, meaning that as the temperature actually decreases, because one on T getting bigger means T is actually getting smaller, as temperature decreases, the viscosity increases. So this here is increasing eta with decreasing T. And we see the uh, linear sort of representation of the equation where the slope here is this E on R, activation energy on the universal gas constant. Okay, that's this, the slope of this particular line E on R, right? So if you're doing an experiment and you can fit a line to the data, so with experiment, Plot graph as so. Then E comes from slope of line and A to zero is intercept on Y axis. All right, so you'll see that these guys are gonna come down here and eventually some point down here intersect with the Y axis. This is your A to zero value, okay? So we kind of presented this in slope intercept form. So here is your intercept where it hits the Y axis, all right? So this is A to naught or the natural log of A to naught, however you kind of want to think about it. So this is how you actually go from experimental data, plotting all of these things on this, you know, vi log viscosity versus one on cap T, plot. So you plot all these things, you extrapolate the linear lines where they intercept the y-axis, you can figure out your constant is a zero. And with the slope, you can figure out what the activation energy E is for each one of these particular pieces. All right, so you're going to do something like this in your homework. So I hope you're ready. I don't think you're ready. Don't think you're ready. Your homework's so bootylicious. All right. Beyonce style. So that's viscosity for you. Uh, we talked about rheology, we talked about cure kinetics, we talked about viscosity, we talked about rheometers, uh, a lot of kind of like material science -y stuff. We talked about the chemical reaction itself. So over the last four lectures, we've been very like material science -y. Um, So a lot different kind of flavor. And these are important things to talk about because 
viscosity models, cure kinetic models, all these sorts of things. If you go on and you work for some company that's develop, developing epoxy resins, you got to know this stuff. You got to know viscosity models. You got to know what a rheometer is. You got to know what a cure kinetic model is. You got to know what degree of cure is. You got to know what a calorimeter is. You got to know all of these things that are useful for like figuring out what is my degree of cure evolution? How long is it going to take for this thing to become a solid? What's the gel time? How do we measure that? So on and so forth. All right. So uh that's all i'm going to kind of say now about cure kinetics and viscosity uh and that'll kind of like conclude this slide deck i have posted another deck and i was kind of considering to myself like what do i want to do next do i want to do sandwich composites next or do i want to do fracture mechanics next and i'm going to do fracture for a couple of reasons that is number one i want to devote a lot of time to fracture so at least like four lectures, probably more like five. So I wanted to give myself enough space so I didn't feel cramped like at the end of the quarter to get everything in because composite fracture, god damn, it's complicated. And it is the dominant mode of failure for composites. So, you know, we've talked a lot about like failure of laminates using help in Psi and Psi Hill theory and all this sort of great, fantastic laminate theory. But I'm telling you right now, composites fail in fracture. Okay, so great that we did all that laminate stuff but fracture is the way all right also sandwich composites when we start talking about sandwich composites we're going to have a loading mode with sandwich composites that we have not seen before in our laminate theory and that is this transverse loading across the face so laminates generally are very thin you know if you think about like the laminate we made right it's like paper thin all right so here's the laminate we made like i turn it sideways and it like you can barely see it. All right, here's our laminate. I turn it sideways, it's like paper. All right, so this guy doesn't support a lot of loading across the face this way, this like transverse loading direction. But once I get the sandwich composites, like sandwich composites, they're thick enough now where we really have to consider what is the loading across the face. And it's this whole new type of like sheer transverse loading. And sheer loading is something that causes failure in sandwich composites that is based in fracture mechanics. So because of that reason, I also want to do fracture um, before I talk about sandwich composites because there's like this shearing mode when you load a sandwich composite where they sort of like slide against each other to cause like sort of like a shear failure. And so I have to talk about the mode two sliding shearing failure that comes with sort of this type of loading where the, the sheets are kind of sliding against each other. So maybe that makes sense to you, maybe it doesn't, but just know that I've decided to go with fracture first over sandwich composites because I got to talk about this um, sort of like failure mode. All right, so new slide deck on fracture, which is posted on Blackboard and probably four and a half lectures probably coming up on, on fracture mechanics. All right, so do your homework on cure kinetics and rheology and viscosity. Do that, do on Wednesday. I'm putting together a fracture homework. That'll probably be due like two weeks from today. All right, roughly, approximately, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let's talk about fracture. How many how many people are in, are in Schaefer's fracture class, by the way? Like fracture and fatigue. Can I just like get into the chat? Like how many people have taken that class? Is he doing like live lectures or is he doing just like post videos and watch them? Is anybody even awake out there? I don't think anyone's awake. All right, not a lot of people in that class. Or not a lot of people awake, hard to say. Do I need to get the dog back to wake you up? He posts videos and we meet once per week. All right. Have you talked about critical strain energy release rate? Rachel Hunter. Not yet, all right, well. Good for you guys or good thing for you guys. I'm going to start kind of like from the ground up on fracture. So whether or not you're taking Schaefer's fracture and fatigue class, you're going to learn about fracture here. And maybe for some of those that are in that class, you're going to maybe see a little bit of redundancy here with what he's done, but um, hopefully not too much. All right. Yeah, metals people tend to come at it from a, like a K1C perspective which is like the uh, uh, stress intensity factor perspective of fracture, which is perfectly fine. Um, metals have a lot of plasticity, and so stress intensity factor tends to be something they commonly explore. But for brittle materials, which composites are, usually it's talked about in terms of energy release, which is the way that I'm going to present it. Uh, and 
I think is probably more commonly used in composites than it is for metals. So I know Schaefer kind of comes from a metals background, so um, that makes sense why he would kind of maybe talk about stress intensity factor uh, first before he starts to talk about strain energy releasing. But okay, without further ado, new topic for the course, and that is fracture of composites. Okay, so like I said, we did a lot of laminate theory and we talked about, you know, Psi Hill failure criteria and which layer is going to fail first if I put it into bend. It. Okay, that's great. Okay, it's a nice theoretical exercise to talk about what's going on with those particular failure theories, but I'm telling you right now, those samples are going to fail in fracture or in delamination between layers far before you're even going to get to that like theoretical strength limit. And this is really the main thing that is holding back composites from the mainstream. And that is, one, they're expensive. Two, they're orthotropic. So people are afraid of doing like, you know, simple analysis with them, meaning like, what is my actual modulus of elasticity? And thirdly, the failure is really complicated, including failure mechanisms associated with fracture. Okay, so people are afraid of composites because it's unpredictable. And unpredictable in the world of engineering always bad all right so let's talk about fracture of composites we'll start with some definitions and we'll just say fracture is kind of like just a general study of how cracks initiate and propagate materials so fracture mechanics So how they initiate and propagate. And people who do fracture, you know, fracture mechanics, they really separate these two things. How do they initiate and then how do they propagate? All right. So in composites, you can have initiation from a lot of different things. So in composites, these cracks can sort of originate in many locations. I showed some pictures of cracks that had formed inside of a composite from residual stresses. Remember when we talked about residual stresses, I showed those pictures where this composite had cooled down from high temperature and because of the intense strain that was between the glass fibers and the epoxy matrix, this crack had formed. All right, so one obvious place is manufacturing defects. All right, so that's number one. Uh, if you have voids inside of your structure, that can play a factor. So, you know, if you mix up your resin and you don't degas it, you're going to have voids. So voids can be a place where uh, cracks initiate and propagate from. Um, ply overlaps can have some space sometime. So if I put down layer number one and then I put down layer number two and I didn't compact them very well, I mean, maybe there can be a big air bubble in there or a big gap in there. Um, other damage sites. So maybe I have a composite and I've scratched the surface and now I've got sort of this nick inside my composite. And now I load it up while a crack can, you know, really propagate from that just very small surface scratch, let's say. All right. Now, in composites, you know, we have this laminated structure, fiber, 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 layer, fiber, layer, so on and so forth. It's pretty rare for cracks to actually propagate within the layers themselves, okay? And that's because you have all these fibers in these layers, which if I'm a crack traveling along, it's really hard for me to like move over all of the fibers that are in each one of the individual layers, okay? It would be a lot easier for me instead if I could just move between the laminate layers, all right? So with composites, Cracks usually move between layers. 
Okay, so what I mean by that is if I had some laminated structure, it looks like this. All right, here's my laminated structure, my composite laminate, and maybe we have fibers in this particular layer. This is kind of like a like a zero degree layer. Uh, right, it's really hard for a crack to like find its way past all these individual fibers, right? Difficult. It's much easier for a crack to just occur like between these layers and just shoot between la layers. All right, so between layers, really easy for that crack to kind of like propagate between. It's really difficult for it to move within a layer, like, like really hard. I mean, it's going to go where it's easiest for the crack to propagate. And as soon as it finds like the edge at the top of the bottom of that particular layer, it's just going to shoot right through that gap. All right. So interfaces are weakest. All right. And that's where we're going to sort of focus our attention. All right. These cracks commonly occurring or moving between these layers. And that's because that's the easiest path for that crack to move. There's not a lot of resistance there. There's nothing slowing it down or or interrupting its propagation or its pathway. All right. So we'll sort of introduce our first definition here now, which is one that we're going to carry through for the rest of the, the discussion on fracture. And that is the definition of critical strain energy release rate, or fracture toughness might be another general term. All right, so here, the resistance to crack growth between layers of a particular composite. Uh, is expressed uh, in terms of its inner laminar fracture toughness. Okay, and I'll give this guy a little underline. Interlaminar fracture toughness. Interlaminar meaning between layers. Fracture toughness meaning a measure of how much this material can resist that crack propagation. All right? This is denoted with the capital letter G. All right, so there's your capital letter G, or sometimes with a subscript C on it. All right, so for the critical interlaminar fracture toughness. The value which would cause crack propagation is the critical value. All right, so G sub C, all right. So this is usually given in units of like energy per crack opening area, and we'll talk about this in a second. So when you think of an energy unit, you should be thinking of something like joules. When you think of crack opening area, area always indicates something like meters squared. All right, so that's a very common unit for critical strain energy release rate, GC, measured in joules per meter squared. How much energy does it take for me to open a crack that has a certain aerial dimension? All right, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Just a second. Um, GC, also called the critical strain energy release rate. All right, so you hear that term, 
I promise you, if you work in the field of fracture of composites, you will hear that term a bazillion times. Critical strain energy release rate or strain energy release rate without the word critical in front is also common. All right, so in this series of slides to come, we're going to talk about how do we test composites to get this value? How do we determine how much energy is required to open a crack of a certain size in a composite? All right, energy will be sort of thought about in terms of load and displacement. All right, so if you remember back to your dynamics class, you had something like the energy of external forces going from position one to position two, is this bringing up nightmares, is the integral of the force that's acting dotted along the path, right? F dot dr. What I mean by that is if you have some bar that you're loading, okay, here's some bar that we're loading, and it displaces or moves out some additional length, okay? Here, it's displaced, what is this certain amount? Delta. So then the work from one to two is just F times delta. All right, this is the work of an external force. So that's, a, you know, just an overview of what we mean by work done. Okay, so when I think about fracture of composites, if I'm pulling on some composite, pull, 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 I can track how much energy I'm putting into that sample by integrating the force that I've put on that sample over the amount of displacement that the sample is undergoing. That is an indication of how much work I've put into the particular sample, right? Force times displacement. All right. So that particular value is a number measured in joules. All right. So that force times displacement, that's some number measured in joules. And then when my crack propagates, okay, I'm pulling, 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 the crack is all of a sudden going to shoot through the material. That's going to create an opening inside of the material, right? I've created a, a new surface. And the area of that new surface that I've created can be measured in meters squared. All right, so I've created a new aerial surface as the crack is propagated. So the amount of energy that it took to create that particular area is the critical strain energy release rate measured in joules per meter squared. All right, so that's the general idea. Before we dive in on uh, calculating these things, we have to talk about the modes of fracture. All right. So thinking about fracture, there's three three main modes of fracture, all with their own critical strain energy release rates. All right. So there are three modes of fracture. All with different strain energy release rates. I'll do my best to sort of draw these, but if you've got some material, here's my block of material, and there's a crack inside of this material. So here's my crack, and it's some distance into the material. All right, so. And this is, you know, going into the material on the back side here as well, All right? So there's my crack that's inside of the material. I got to have three possible modes of fracture to sort of propagate that crack along. All right, the first and most obvious is if I sort of pull this guy up here and pull this guy down here, this is the mode one opening. All right, it's attempting to like open the mouth. All right, so that's mode one opening. Uh, and that's obviously going to cause these two like cantilevers to sort of like be pulled open in this sort of fashion. All right, I got a sample here. I can show you sort of what it looks like. I think we kind of all get this. Here's a composite sample. All right, it's got these like piano hinges on it. Hopefully we can sort of see this. It has a pre-crack in it that's moving kind of to your right. So I can pull this open. Hopefully we can sort of see that opening up. Rawr! Okay, that's mode one. All right. The next mode is the sort of sliding mode. That's this mode here. 
And if we're talking about, you know, structures that are undergoing like transverse loading, they're going to kind of like bend down like this and slide against each other. So this is the important one for sandwich structures. And this is mode two, which is moving into and out of the board here. Okay, so this is mode two. Maybe I should do this in a different color. Let's do this in a different color. So if I have the top piece and I'm pushing in on it, and the bottom piece I'm sort of pulling out on it, this is mode two. And again, this is like the sliding mode. So think of like a deck of cards. Like when you push on a deck of cards, all the layers slide against each other in this sort of fashion. All right, that's this like sliding mode. This is mode two. All right, the last one, I like to call the trouser tear. Uh, is you take these two guys and you slide them this way against each other. It's like this like torquing motion. So if you think about having a piece of paper with a slit in it and you rip the piece of paper down the middle, right? So here's a piece of paper. I just put a rip in it. I rip it down the center. This is this mode three, okay? There's this crack that occurs and I'm pulling on it in this particular way. That's the mode three, the trouser tear or the out of plane shear, right? Okay, so that guy, I'll use red is sort of pulling this way and pushing here. All right, so this is mode three. Uh, it's this guy here. All right, so like ripping this guy open, the trouser tear. All right, so these actually have like real names. Uh, so if you hear mode one, this is just called the opening mode. Mode two is in plane shear. That's because the loads are in the same direction as the crack travel. So it's in the plane of the crack travel. And mode three is this trouser tear mode, which we call out of plane shear. And that's because my loads are kind of across the face, but my crack propagation is in this general direction. So the loads are not in the same direction as the crack propagation will go, all right? So there are your three different types of crack opening. Uh, there's a picture in the notes, might be a little bit more clear. I probably should have just like copy and pasted this. Um, but I think it's, it's more fun to try to draw it myself. I was playing Pictionary with my family this weekend and I didn't do very well. <laughs> Let's just say that. All right, so there you go. There's a kind of a little bit better description. So here is like this mode one, pulling open this particular piece. Mode two, kind of pushing in, pulling out. And then out of plane shear uh, is this guy here, this trouser tear uh, kind of idea where you're sort of pulling this thing down and together at the same time. All right, those are your fracture modes. Each has its own critical strain energy release rate. So each has its own GC, which we label with uh, sort of a subscript. So for mode one, G1C. For mode two, G2C. And for mode three, you guessed it, G3C, all right? One, mode two, and mode three. Even for a composite sample. All right, so here's a composite that I have. You remember I kind of like ripped this open before. Uh, the amount of energy it would take me for me to propagate the crack by ripping it open this way is different than the amount of energy it would take for me if I was trying to like slide it in this fashion, right, up and down, or if I was trying to shear it across with this like mode three, okay? It takes a different amount of energy to propagate the crack in all three of those situations. And so we have to distinguish when we're talking about fracture of composites, are we talking about the mode one opening, the mode two opening, or the mode three opening? and how much energy is associated with propagating the crack in each one of those different loading situations. Okay, good introduction. We'll dive in on the math starting on Wednesday. All right, thanks for coming. Should I get Rocky back in here? Wednesday. <laughs>